Hello, and welcome to a lecture on Maximum Gain. I'm Steve Ellingson. In this lecture, we're going to talk about three things. First, what is the maximum gain that we can expect from a two-port? Secondly, for what values of gain is stable operation possible? And thirdly, how do we select active devices, and typically in this course we're talking about transistors, based on these considerations. So first I'm going to remind you about TPG, transducer power gain, because that's the definition of gain that's really most relevant to the discussion we're about to have. I'll talk about simultaneous conjugate matching, which is really the answer to the uh, question, how do we get maximum gain? Then I'll discuss the concept of maximum available gain, which is a useful way to compare active devices. We'll do an example design where we'll actually take a, a transistor and determine how to achieve maximum gain in an amplifier that uses that transistor. Then I'll talk about maximum stable gain, also known as MSG. I'll talk about the role of MAG and MSG in the selection of active devices. Then finally, a glimpse of the path forward for amplifier design. Okay, so first, TPG. I'll just remind you that it's defined as the power delivered to the load relative to the power available from the source. In other words, the power that we see dissipated in the load uh, relative to the power that the source could dissipate into a conjugate matched uh, thing that is attached to the source only. And here are the variables for those two things. And then we also worked out an expression that gives us the TPG if we know the S parameters and if we know the source and load impedances. And as usual, the source impedance is represented by a source reflection coefficient and the load impedance is represented by a load reflection coefficient. Now this accounts for everything. It accounts for the two port via the S parameters, accounts for the source impedance and counts for the load impedance. So everything that's relevant here in a analysis of the gain of some two port is represented in this equation. But once again, I'll point out this is not the only useful definition of gain. In a previous lecture, I probably pointed out that there's at least three other common definitions of gain really four if you include voltage gain. Okay, simultaneous conjugate matching. Transducer power gain is maximized by conjugate matching the input and output ports. Now, let me just draw a picture of what's going on here. Here is the two port represented by its S parameters. It has an output port. It has an input port. There's a source reflection coefficient, which represents the source impedance. There is a load reflection coefficient, which represents the load impedance. Now in this case, the embedded input reflection coefficient is given by this expression. We discussed this in a previous lecture. So if we're looking into the two port, then the embedded input reflection coefficient is what we see when ZL is actually attached to the output. Now if we want to maximize gain, we should conjugate match uh, that impedance. So what we're going to want is for this embedded input impedance to be equal to the conjugate of the source impedance. That'll be a requirement for maximizing gain. Similarly, we can consider the embedded output reflection coefficient. And what we're going to want to do there is conjugate match that to, or make this equal to the conjugate of the load reflection coefficient. Right? So what we're doing here is considering what we need to do for the input and output ports to be conjugate matched. And we have to use the embedded reflection coefficient expressions because this conjugate matching has to take place for whatever terminations actually exist. So what we have here is simultaneous equations. The simultaneous equations are in gamma S and gamma L. By making these substitutions, we've eliminated gamma sub in and gamma sub out. So now we have two equations in terms of the S parameters and gamma sub S and gamma sub L. And we know the S parameters 
We don't know what gamma sub s and gamma sub l should be, but we have now the simultaneous equations that we need to solve to get there. And we call the solutions to these simultaneous equations, at least for our purposes, gamma sub s max and gamma sub l max, because these are the solutions to the simultaneous equations, which then give us the uh, maximum uh, transducer power gain in this arrangement. Now, there's no guarantee that the two port is stable under these conditions. Stability is a separate consideration. So, in general, you go into a problem like this, you should first confirm stability or unconditional stability, preferably. If it's unconditionally stable, fine. Whatever solution you get from this is going to work. However, if it's conditionally stable, then you have to be a little bit careful. You can run this procedure. And then you should check to see that the resulting uh, source and load impedances are such that the result will be uh, stable. So you have to be kind of careful to make sure that uh, you're doing this in a situation where the result is associated with a stable outcome. I'm not going to solve those equations for you. Uh, they are quite mathematically difficult, uh, I, I will tell you. But the uh, solutions are readily available, and they're on this slide. So the solution to those simultaneous equations on the previous slide are uh, right here. What you do is you compute these parameters, b sub 1, b sub 2, m, and n. And these are properties of the two-port. In fact, intrinsic properties of the two-port. You can tell this because they depend only on the s parameters. Here's our old friend delta here, which I defined in a previous lecture, which also depends only on S parameters. So B1, B2, M, and N are just four numbers that are also intrinsic properties of the two port because they are depending only on the S parameters. Once I know those four parameters, I can plug them into these equations and that will give me the values of gamma sub S and gamma sub L that will maximize the transducer power gain in this scenario. And then once again, and you could get tired of hearing me say this probably by the end of the lecture, this is certain only if the two port is unconditionally stable. If it's not, you can try this, but you need to check at the end to make sure that the result will be stable. All right, maximum available gain, MAG. What we are interested now in is what gain, what transducer power gain should we expect if we do simultaneous conjugate matching? Well, recall that we have this expression for transducer power gain, and now we have expressions for gamma sub s and gamma sub l for the situation in which we've achieved maximum gain, that is the simultaneous conjugate matching solutions. And we could substitute those expressions, that one right there and that one right there, back into this expression and that would tell us then what the maximum transducer power gain is. Again this is a great exercise. Uh, graduate students I highly recommend that you uh, try this at least once. You may gain some insight from it but in general it's, it's just a complicated math problem. I will take you directly to the solution. So if we substitute gamma sub s max for gamma s and gamma sub l max for gamma l and do the algebra we find that the maximum transducer power gain, that is that associated with simultaneous conjugate matching, is given by this expression. Okay, first, you will recognize K, that is the Rolet stability metric. It's that K from the Rolet stability metric. So I've already defined what this is, but that's a function of S parameters. So K is also intrinsic property of the uh, two port. So we now have an expression for the maximum transducer power gain entirely in terms of the S parameters. And this is what we refer to as the mag, the maximum available gain. It is the maximum transducer power gain when we have simultaneous conjugate matching. And here is the expression that we can use to calculate that maximum gain. Okay, let's do an example. We previously discussed this transistor, the Avago AT41511. It doesn't matter here, but just so you know, it's an NPN BJT bipolar transistor. Very common. I showed you the data sheet, I think, in a previous lecture. Uh, we'll assume it's common emitter configuration. Again, it won't matter for what we're about to do here, except in the sense that we need to know that to select the S parameters. Here's the collector emitter bias voltage and the collector current. 
Again, we need to know this only because we need those to look up the S parameters. So the question now is, what is the maximum TPG for this transistor at 2 gigahertz? And if a simultaneous conjugate match design exists, what is it? What is that design? So first we need the S parameters. So from a previous lecture, uh, from that data sheet I showed you, uh, here's the table of S parameters. We look down here until we see 2 gigahertz, which is the frequency that we've been requested to look at. Here, indicated by this line, are the S parameters in polar notation. Again, you should have some practice in converting between polar and Cartesian and what other form, whatever other forms you need. At 2 gigahertz, well, we've already confirmed that we have unconditional stability. You can look back at that previous lecture and you'll see that we actually did that. And then if we apply our definition of mag, which I showed you on the previous slide, MAG, we find 12.5 dB. So what we have learned is that this particular transistor in this particular configuration at 2 gigahertz is unconditionally stable. So we know that the simultaneous conjugate match that we design is going to also be stable. We know that the gain of that design will be 12.5 dB. And furthermore, no other design can be have greater gain, right? 12.5 uh, dB is the maximum. Any other design will result in a lower transducer power gain. And just as a matter of interest here, I've also calculated the intrinsic forward gain which is the magnitude squared of S21. And you'll note it's quite a bit lower. Now, I like to point this out because this is what you'd get if you matched the input and output of that transistor to 50 ohms, to the reference impedance. So you see that matching or matching the ports of the reference impedance doesn't do much for you in terms of uh, gain. It doesn't give you any particular gain. It certainly doesn't give you the maximum available gain you actually get the maximum available gain by mismatching the ports. So I just want to repeat this one more time. The maximum TPG at 2 gigahertz given by simultaneous conjugate matching and the answer is 12.5 dB. This, this 8.9 dB, is the TPG if the input and output are terminated into the reference impedance. So that's the difference between those two answers. Okay, now I want to know what that uh, solution actually is so I work the equations and I find that gamma s max and gamma l max are given by these values and uh, by all means please check my math it's a good exercise for you to make sure you know uh, exactly what this notation means and and just to confirm that you can do this problem when the time comes on a homework assignment or an exam uh, and later on in a design project so we find that gamma sub s max is has a magnitude of uh, 0.728 and an angle of minus 159 degrees. Gamma sub L max is uh, a magnitude of 0.767 at an angle of plus 50 degrees. And of course, these now represent impedances. So you could very easily now translate this, uh, va these two values into the actual source and load impedances, right? So this gives you Z sub S and this gives you Z sub L. Very simple operation to do that because you know what the reference impedance is. So you should make sure you know how to do that as well. Okay, checking your answer. Whenever you have a complicated problem, uh, a lot of calculation involved, uh, it's always a good idea to, to do this. You know, we can take those values that we computed for gamma sub S and gamma sub L on the previous slide. We can plug them back into the TPG equation, as I've suggested here, and then see what we get. And if you do the math right, you'll get 12.5 dB here, which is the maximum gain that we calculated in the first step. So everything hangs together here. It appears that that solution that gives us the reflection coefficients, that maximized gain, is in fact maximizing gain. So everything seems to be okay here. All right, now looking ahead, the essence of transistor design is going to be mismatching the input and the output. So what I'm showing here is a common emitter uh, BJT, right? The input is the base emitter junction. The output is the collector emitter junction. And this is the two port that we've really been considering in this example. 
And what we found now is a value of gamma sub s that goes here and gamma sub l that goes here. And those, of course, infer the values of z sub s and z sub l that we need to see looking in either direction. Now, what commonly happens is that we are requested to deliver a design with a specified impedance. That specified impedance is commonly, but not always, the reference impedance. So for example, you might be asked to design an amplifier that has input and output ports of 50 ohms. Well, these interfaces here are certainly not going to be 50 ohms. We've just discovered this. So we will require an input matching network and an output matching network. So the essence of amplifier design is going to be selecting a transistor, deciding whether it's going to be common emitter, common base, uh, and so on, getting those S parameters, finding the terminations that we want that achieve our design goals, and then turning around to designing these input and output matches. All right. So at this point, it should become clear to you why you're going to need uh, or why we're going to have to go through uh, a couple weeks of impedance matching techniques. We need to know how to do impedance matching uh, with sufficient uh, skill that we can readily design these input and output matching networks. Once we can do that, then we can go from these specified source and load impedances to the desired input and output impedances uh, for an amplifier. So that's the path looking forward. Okay, one more concept I'd like to talk about. And that's the maximum stable gain. We've talked about the maximum available gain. Now we'd like to talk about maximum stable gain. Maximum available gain was defined this way. That was maximum available gain. Now the question is, what is the upper bound on gain if the two port is only stable and not unconditionally stable, right? So we have this problem that everything is pretty clear and simple if everything's unconditionally stable, but if it's only conditionally stable, we don't know in advance if the simultaneous conjugate matching solutions can give us the maximum gain because we don't know if it's available or not. The best answer to this question is a brute force search over all reasonable terminations. So one of the things you can do is you can search over all values of gamma sub s, because remember they all have magnitude less than one, and all values of gamma sub l, remember they all have values of magnitude less than one. So it's a four-dimensional search. You can search in that four-dimensional space and check every point to see what the gain is and whether it is stable for those terminations. And then you can find the gain which is maximum under the constraint that it's stable. So this is not very hard to do. It's simple exercise in programming uh, and it's really the best answer to the question. Now having said that there's a number of reasons why you probably don't want to do this. For example if you're quickly thumbing through data sheets it's a bit of a chore to keep entering S parameters and crunching through a program to try to figure out uh, how how stable you can be. And in fact, there's always this question of how close to instability you really want to run the uh, amplifier uh, because component values may result in, in, in a situation where you accidentally cross the line into instability just because of tolerances and component values. So this is, uh, this is okay, uh, but we'd like to see if we can come up with a, uh, a simpler, more convenient, even if it's an approximate approach. So here's the idea. Recall that unconditional stability is guaranteed if the roulette stability metric is greater than 1. Now if k is 1, then k minus the square root of k squared minus 1 is 1. So if k is 1, then this whole thing here is 1. So what we do is we define this thing called maximum stable gain, MSG, and that's this thing. So just to be clear, this is the maximum stable gain. It's basically the maximum available gain with k set to 1. And what this is is an educated guess. It's not for certain that this is right, right? but it's, a, it's the best guess that you can come up with without knowing in advance what the terminations are going to be. So if you have a conditionally stable device and you don't know in advance what terminations you're going to want to use, this is about the best you can do in terms of guessing what the upper bound on gain is going to be.
So that's all there is to it. Again, it's not exact. It's a it's an upper bound, and really it's an approximate upper bound. So just keep those things in mind. Nevertheless, it's useful for comparing devices because all I need to know is the S21 and the S12, and I can compute this value. So as I pointed out here, the primary utility of MAG, which is what this is, and MSG, which is what this is, is for selection of transistors for uh, RF amplifiers. So, for example, we can return once again to this transistor, the Avago AT41511, in the same configuration, just so we're working with the same S parameters. And at 1 gigahertz, you'll recall that this was conditionally stable because the roulette stability factor metric was uh, only uh, uh, 0.781. Uh, the MSG, then, is the appropriate thing to compute. MAG here does not make sense to compute because it's not unconditionally stable. It does make sense to compute the MSG because that's, uh, that's really the purpose of that metric. Now we can also do the brute force search. So I've done this for you in this case. You may have a chance to do this later in the course. But I've done a brute force search over that four-dimensional space for all possible source and load impedances. And I found that the max stable TPG is 23.8 dB. In other words, there is a choice of source and load impedances for which I achieve 23.8 dB TPG and the device is stable uh, with those terminations. Uh, and you'll see that that's quite a bit different from the MSG. So MSG is an approximate upper bound. It's really only useful for comparing different devices. It's not really good as an estimate of the gain. It's more useful for comparing different devices at 2 gigahertz, uh, recall K is uh, 1.089, just barely unconditionally stable, and the mag is 12.5 dB, as we've already shown. So just showing you how this kind of analysis would work uh, for a uh, common transistor. Here's how that same information is often depicted in data sheets. So often, not always, but increasingly often these days, you can flip through the data sheet of an RF transistor and you will now more often than not see a chart that looks something like this. So in this chart we have frequency along the x-axis, we have gain along the vertical axis, in dB in this case, and the caption here says it's for our transistor, for the collector emitter voltage we've been working with and the collector current that we've been working with, and it's plotted conveniently the uh, transducer power gain and the S21. So just to recall, refresh your memory, this is the intrinsic forward gain, right? It says S21, but what it really is is S21 magnitude squared. They're just being a little bit lazy in the data sheet. Uh, but this is the intrinsic forward gain, this is the dashed curve. From here to here, we're looking at maximum available gain. And that's what they're telling you there. Now, this infers, even though they're not telling you this, this infers that this device is unconditionally stable here. All right. So from about 1.5 gigahertz to about 4 gigahertz or so, we're looking at unconditional stability. Below 1.5 gigahertz, they're specifying MSG. So there, we obviously have conditional stability. And similarly, above 4 gigahertz or so, I'm not exactly sure what the value they intend to indicate here is, uh, it's also conditionally stable. And that's consistent with what we found. We found that 1 gigahertz, we had conditional stability. And we found at 2 gigahertz, we had unconditional stability. So if we had known about this chart, uh, before we started working these numbers, we actually could have looked those up uh, quite quickly. But once again, uh, note that uh, the transducer power gain uh, maximized uh, is uh, typically greater than the intrinsic forward gain. Because again, the intrinsic forward gain is what you get if you just choose the reference impedance as the terminating impedance, and there's no reason to expect that to deliver maximum gain. That's just a, the reference impedance is just to define the S parameter, so there's no special reason to expect that to be a, a particularly good solution. Okay, so the path forward. We now know a lot about how to design a two-port for maximum gain. 
but this is useful only if we have an unconditionally stable transistor we wish the maximum possible gain. After all, the title of this lecture was Maximum Gain. And we could consider doing a brute force search for maximum gain. But just in general, we have some other issues to deal with. One is, well, again, how do we design suitable matching networks? We now see that we're going to need an IMN uh, and an OMN. And so the topic of the next few lectures is going to be about how to design those. We're also going to have to know a little bit more about how to do transistor selection. We're going to have to know a little bit more about transistor configuration, in other words, common emitter, uh, or do we want something else? Uh, maybe we're going to use a FET, and maybe it ends up being common source, uh, and so on. And then transistor biasing is going to be something we have to grapple with. And the reason is because we will not be able to separate the DC bias network from the RF impedance matching network. So we're going to have to develop a set of skills that allows us to develop circuitry that simultaneously achieves a certain bias condition at DC while delivering a specified impedance at RF. So these are the topics that we are going to address over the next month or so. And by the time the smoke clears on all this, we'll be in a real good position to design transistor amplifiers. That concludes this lecture on maximum gain.